this is Mead, and today we're going to do a demo of taking a object noton painting where you're using one to four values and translating that into a full value uh, monochrome painting. Um, this is kind of like the project number two in beginning painting. So you can begin anywhere. In this case, I'm just beginning with one of the brighter areas. Um, you can see in the reference that the top of this little uh, this little pedestal is one of the the single brightest areas in the painting. So I figured that would be a place to start. And for this monochrome, I'm using black, white, and some red. And basically, the procedure is you want to get the the canvas, or in this case, paper, covered as quickly as possible so that you can begin to make real judgments about um, how dark and how light everything is relative to each other. So I do a lot of brush mixing. You can mix with a palette knife. Um, it doesn't really matter as long as you're mixing your paints um, in a logical and, and sort of prepared way. Um, you'll notice there are several differences between the painting and the reference. Um, used to exaggerate for kind of compositional effect. Um, one of the things that I like to do is I like to begin um, uh, on the end of the value scale. So here I'm starting in the in the lightest area of the value scale. And then every time I mix color, um, I can go just a little bit darker. So the way I see the reference photo is you have light that's hitting the top of this pedestal and it's getting more light than the than the larger floor area and that means that you just go a step darker for the floor and sometimes I feel like those value relationships can get too close so here I'm, I went back and repainted and brightened up and or lightened up that area and then what I do is I kind of look for areas to um, anchor any particular values that I think are important. So the value uh, and color of this shadow that goes behind this uh, the sculpture's head um, is kind of a, a middle, like a dark middle gray. Um, if you squint at the photo, it's not very dark. Um, and it certainly needs to be lifted from full black. One of the weaknesses of the Noton is that you wind up painting all the shadows twice um, because you paint everything in black to judge the shapes and then you have to lift all the blacks into grays to get color in there. Um, so that's not necessarily the most efficient way to paint per se, but it's good when you're starting out or if you're trying to tackle a particularly good uh, or a particularly con complex subject, um, it gives you the chance to really evaluate what you're doing early on. Um, so what I'm kind of doing is judging where the middle values kind of fall. And, and I'm putting just mild amounts of reds into the shadows. Because what I figured is I would do a more saturated light um, area and then I'd use like cooler temperatures use the blacks uh, in the shadows at least for the background um, you know thinking ahead I probably want a more saturated uh, color range on the statue itself so one of the one of the games you play is um, if you can find areas where values are similar to each other, you can place that same bit of color all over the painting. Um, and when values are just are similar but slightly different, then you go back and you kind of compare on your palette um, how much that color needs to change. And again, I'm, for this one, I'm just using acrylic paint. This process is the same no matter what paint you use. Um, you, know, you could be using oil, you could be using gouache, and you could use much the same 
ideas here. Um, I like to use uh, the Liquitex Ultra Matte Medium um, because it dries very, very flat. There's no shine. So when you take pictures of it, um, it'll be easier to see. Uh, there won't be any reflections coming out in the pictures. One of the interesting things you can do is um, every time you kind of come back to the painting when you're brush mixing, you'll mix the colors just slightly differently. And I think that creates a lot of interest in paintings. And I would suggest that you do that intentionally um, so that you create a level of interest and sophistication with the paintings that you make um, that's beyond what you would normally do. Um, when you go back and look at old master works, you'll see that with any repeated element, say they're painting the side of a building, the shadows in each um, you know, window are going to be slightly different colors every time. And they had the time to go back and, and to um, you know, refine and change and make minute color shifts to make things more interesting to look at. Um, and so we can, you know, kind of quickly do that as well. And the way I've been thinking about painting lately with almost every subject is once you kind of get clear on the shapes, and that's what the Noton allows you to do, your main job after that is to differentiate shapes. And what I mean by differentiating the shape is that um, I need to put literally a different color and or value um, in each shape to make it distinct from the other. Um, that's kind of like my first job. Once all the shapes are kind of differentiated uh, from each other and we can see each shape clearly, then we can kind of make further judgments about, well, do I need to change the, the actual shape a little bit? Do I need to change the color or the value? And I can keep working on paintings uh, going through in multiple passes uh, to make fundamental changes or add complexity or simplify things. Um, so, you know, for me, it's been kind of freeing to think about just, oh, well, just make this a different color rather than really work on putting the correct color down. I find that it's really tough to put the right value and color down until you get um, the whole painting kind of covered. And this takes a minute, you know? Um, this video is heavily shortened, too. I took out all of the time when I wasn't actively painting and um, and mixing on the brush. So, you know, your actual painting time is probably going to be 50% mixing color and 50% uh, applying paint on the canvas. Um, and that's probably, and that's okay. Because what that's doing too, is that's giving you a lot of time to think. And at a certain point when you're working on your paintings, you want to be thinking just as much as you're painting. Um, because really, you know, painting is a thought exercise. You're thinking, oh, how do I, how do I change these colors? Um, you know, how do I capture this, this sense of lighting and so on. So here in a minute, I'll at least have most of the painting of the painting covered as far as the background goes. That's kind of the main initial job here. And you kind of look for things as you're filling in large background shapes, like you look for gradient transitions where something will get darker to lighter or lighter to darker. And you'll also look for gradient transitions in color where something goes warmer to cooler as it goes lighter to darker, for instance. Um, and so you look for all these ways that you can add color shifts into the painting um, as you go as you go along. And you can also do things to make you know small improvements to the paint to the painting and to the composition by making changes 
from your reference. Um, and I think use, you know, not, you're not necessarily copying your reference every single time. You're always going to make changes to your reference. And I think that that's highly encouraged. Um, you don't want to be the direct copier of every single photo reference that you use. You want to inject your own color sensibility, your own sense of shapes and your own sense of lighting in there. Um, you're painting from a reference, but you're also editing as well. Um, so I think that that's, that's important to keep in mind as you go. And that should, that should be just generally a part of your process that eventually you start using references, um, in different ways to like, you're not just painting the exact thing that you see from a reference. You're using the reference to create the image that you have in your head. And that's a, that's slightly different. So now I'm getting into the actual sculpture itself and I've mixed up um, significantly more intense um, dark reds here. They have much more saturated saturation than anything else in the painting so far. And um, I think that just goes along with the reference photo that the, uh, the blues, the blue greens and blues in the, in the reference are very, very saturated. And since we're using a red monochrome, we have to um, adapt our color scheme this way. And then here, what I'm looking for is I'm just tracking the big areas of light. I'm not really too worried about any particular likeness to the sculpture. It just needs to be a curious looking object in the painting. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? Because really what we're exploring, we're not exploring, you know, trying to create this exact likeness of this particular figure. Um, we're just exploring the kind of color ranges and shape ranges we can get when we do a monochrome. And to me, that's, uh, that's more interesting. And when you're learning, what's going to happen is, you know, we just focused on shape for the noton. And now that we're into monochromes, we're adding in uh, color shifts and value shifts too. So as you're focusing on color and value shifts, you might lose a little bit of the practice that you did on shapes. Um, and that's okay. Because you're going to start being able to juggle all of these concepts all at the same time. So what's happening is you're kind of like, you're probably going to over focus on just creating these, these color and value relationships. And then you kind of lose focus on some of the previous concepts that you've learned. So just know that eventually all that's going to get ironed out and you're going to have a painting practice that's um, really supports the way that you want to, that you want to do things because you're going to learn um, a lot of new concepts and you're going to build everything back together as you go. Um, one of the questions that uh, always comes up with references like this is, you know, do I go in there and do I paint the eyes and the nose individually? Um, because, you know, you can kind of see it there. And he, the answer would be like, maybe, maybe not. Um, what's more important is that you get the plane shift from the head to the eyes to the snout here and to the nose. And the eyes are kind of secondary. If you really overly focused on the eyes, it could wind up looking pretty bad. So you could do just little swatches of darker areas where the eyes are going to go. But you don't want to pull too much emphasis to them. So now the painting is basically done for this stage. You may have to do multiple passes to get the monochrome that you like, um, and that's totally fine. Um, this this uh, painting is going to get continued in another video. Um, if you watch to the end and you enjoy the video, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, get in touch with me if you have any questions. I appreciate all your time watching and um, look forward to uh, the future.